Well, good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder, and this is BRN AM for Saturday, July 18th, 2020. And our top story this week, inheriting clutter, some tips for better estate planning. Joining me now to discuss this and more is Julie Hall, better known as the estate lady. Julie, welcome to the program this morning. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. Uh, great to chat with you again. We chatted on the podcast earlier at the beginning of the week. You have a new book out. It's called Inheriting Clutter, How to Calm the Chaos Your Parents Leave Behind. And Julie, you know, we're going through this COVID crisis. Unfortunately, people have passed away. But this shouldn't be the first time that people are thinking about handling their estate. What's the best way to dispense with their assets and, and leaving it to heirs? Well, everybody needs a game plan. And the game plan usually starts with having some conversations while everybody is still physically and mentally able to do so. So I am a big advocate of having that conversation with mom and dad as an adult child and really opening up some of those difficult things to talk about. Yeah, I mean, there there are a lot of things in, in the book. I mean, you go into this in more detail, but there are a lot of Hard, difficult situations, right? I mean, anytime you talk about money uh, with siblings or with uncles and aunts and even spouses, I mean, that can lead to uh, trouble. And if someone has a very, uh, not trouble, but diff- difficulty, and if someone has a, fair, a very favorite heirloom that they want, sometimes that, that can create a tug of war between uh, people in a family. You know, my mother always used to say, weddings and funerals, you see people's true colors. And she was absolutely right. And when somebody, um, maybe they haven't planned and they passed away suddenly or not, and then contention has a tendency to begin because um, what we see between siblings is he said, she said, no, mom said I could have that. No, dad said I could have that. And it becomes a, a game of tug of war that lasts a lot longer than the week of the funeral. It goes on sometimes the rest of their lives. And I have had a front row seat to this. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that is a pleasant thing to go through and, and arbitrate. And, you know, typically I think you work with executors, right? Or families seek, seeking to either establish a trust or an estate or looking to dispense an estate or distribute an estate. I'm not sure the correct terminology. Um, what are some best practices. I would think that starting early, and I'm not saying once you come out of the womb, you come up with an estate plan, but I think probably sooner rather than later, um, but about what age does it make sense to to do this? Well, you know, if you're asking me my personal opinion, I think um, as an adult, once you become an adult, you don't have to have a huge estate sitting on a hillside to have a will. So I think as an adult or when you first get married, it's very, very important. Um, Unfortunately, illness and death does occur in the young as well as the old. So especially if you're young, you have children, you just got married, even if you've just been divorced or widowed, you need to change your will because things change every few years. It's important to give thought ahead of time to the allocation of your tangible as well as intangible assets. So when you say tangible versus intangible, I think you're talking obviously money. So that means bank accounts, investments, the home, Uh, but intangible would be those things like an heirloom that I mentioned at the beginning of the segment, like a, a nice rug or a piece of artwork or even a favorite blanket. Well, I think that those would fall under the category of tangibles, Uh, personal property. Intangible is more like the cash or the investments. Usually the real estate is, for for most people, it's going to be the largest asset. However, uh, selling a home and dividing the cash is the easy part. It's the division and the allocation and the lack of documentation that has not taken place prior to infirmity or death that is the crux of the problem. That's what people fight over. Yeah, and and one of the things we talk about in the retirement industry, and as you know, I've spent 25 plus years in the business, and we always talk about beneficiaries. And you made the really interesting point that if you have a change of life, if you get married, 
or whatever you may, or divorced, you may want to change your beneficiaries. And you make the point that you need to do that. And, and it's like almost like a living document, right, Julie? I mean, it's something that you keep close. You keep, everyone should have a file, uh, whether it's a, a physical file, uh, an electronic file um, that they keep that has all this information in one place and their heirs or people that are responsible for their distribution of their assets should have access to this information. Absolutely. It, at least the executor or the executrix. Your attorney should have a, a copy as well if one is involved. Um, but this way, they have a tendency not to disappear if somebody has a hard copy of the original. But it's very important. Anytime you have a life change, you need to revisit that will. And unfortunately, for the 50% of us that do have a will, we kind of forget about it after we make it and and problems can arise from that too yeah if you don't know where it is uh what, what good is it i mean a copy should probably be with your attorney as you said you should have a copy and then anyone probably named in the will should probably have a copy or no at least just know the, ex it is. the executor or the executrix could have a copy of course it's a public document once somebody is deceased i believe but if we take a couple of steps back that game plan that we were talking about should include doing all of this up front, allocating assets, documenting this, making sure the adult children know the location of your legal documents, that, which not only includes the will, but the advanced health care directives, which is very important, yes. power of attorney and such. And then... What are you going to do with all the stuff? We haven't even talked about the stuff yet. And that's the part that everybody gets stuck on because for the first time, the children walk back into the estate after mom has maybe moved out or has passed away. They walk in and they're completely paralyzed. They don't know where to begin. They don't know what stuff is worth. And they're completely overwhelmed and bad mistakes happen. Yeah, and you don't need to be we're not talking about wealthy, right? We're not talking about, you don't need to be a millionaire. This is just for real Americans out there who are listening, who are trying to plan. This is, this is just part of the life process. Julie, what about digital assets? So a lot of people, I don't use Facebook, but a lot of people use Facebook. They have numerous passwords for different bank accounts and investment accounts. And you should probably keep that stuff located in one area as well, right? I think you, your executor, executress, is, is that how you refer to it, should have that information too. Oh, yes. I think that's very important. And, and a lot of people forget that. We've got passwords for our digital life. Um, and I have many friends, unfortunately, who have passed away and their profiles are still floating around in social mm. media as if they are still with us because the family didn't think to take it down or they didn't have the passwords. So not only passwords, you need to know where are the locations of certain keys. You know, dad has a classic car in the garage, but if you don't know where the keys are, then you've got a problem. Yeah. You also need copies of deeds and titles uh, or know where they are. You have to know the location. And unfortunately, most people are not well organized and don't have these things in files. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. And so if you don't do this thing and leave somebody, some people just with an idea of what could happen. If you don't do anything and you don't figure out how to distribute your assets and you don't appoint an executor, regardless of how much money you have, this goes to oftentimes we'll go to probate, right? And then the state that you reside in, and there's 50 states, last I checked, and they all have probably all have different rules. So they, they would probably distribute the assets based on their rules. Well, it has to go through the probate process, which could take a couple of months to two years, which means everything kind of has to sit in place until it is complete. Like if there's debt in the estate, that has to be settled first. So um, to avoid probate, some people will, will have a trust if they are able and if they are advised by their estate planning lawyer. Yeah, well, all amazing tips, all found in your new book, Inheriting Clutter, how to calm the chaos from you receive from your parents. Julie Hall, the estate lady, always a pleasure chatting with you, really insightful. Best of luck with the book, and we look forward to having you back in the program very soon. I do as well, thank you so much. Thanks, Julie, great to see you. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. So stay tuned right here.
on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. The windows on our homes, they protect us in the ones we love, but they do much more. At Renewal by Anderson, making your home more comfortable is at the center of every window we make. It's why we custom build our windows in America and install them in as little as one day. It's why we build our frames with exclusive Fibrex composite material that's two times stronger than vinyl. It's why our glass helps keep your home warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and quieter all year long. It's why we stand behind every window with a 20-year limited warranty. Why not help lower your energy costs while giving your home and family the best? Call 1-800-835-6525 to schedule a free in-home consultation. Buy one, get one at 40% off with this special offer. Plus, get special financing with no money down, no monthly payments, and no interest for one full year. Renewal by Anderson, the better way to a better window. Call 1-800-835-6525 now. Welcome back. On Wednesday, I spoke with Pivot Charter School's Abigail Titus about some of the decision-making that goes in to sending children back to the classroom. Let's take a look. There's a lot to consider. And I think the main factors are, of course, health, but also students' academic and social progress. So it's kind of a um, something you have to weigh both sides of. Uh, there are certain officials who say that going back to a classroom is fairly safe for uh, children and their families. And they urge children to go back so that there are not huge gaps in learning and so that students don't miss social and emotional development during critical mm -hmm. years. And so that is something to consider uh, if you're able to do that health-wise. However, on the other hand, of course, it's a risk to bring all these children from our community together uh, indoors into classrooms where they could get sick or get other people sick. And so it really depends what's best for your child and for your family but it's worth exploring those other options. There are more than there ever have been before. One thing to be aware of is that some local school districts have had a independent study program uh, within them for years. And so those can be a better option for certain families to kind of do homeschooling with a ton of curriculum support with something that's really built out to make sure that students are meeting every academic need that they need for that school year. So those more developed programs that have been around before COVID are the ones that are more likely to cover the academics that you would hope to see, as opposed to teachers developing for the first time an online curriculum uh, at the school that you may have been at in the fall or in the spring. And in fact, I was seeing this and other teachers were seeing this even before the pandemic started. Students are struggling more socially 
and we typically attribute it to uh, an increase in screen time and less interactions with people face to face. So students are coming to us self-reporting that they feel social anxiety and that mm-hmm. they don't feel comfortable. Middle school is already a hard time uh, yeah. for anyone in their life. And it's only uh, that's only increased by certain technologies that we've adapted. And so it definitely is a concern to think of students going another uh, six months or another school year without that interaction. So if you're in a situation as a family where you have the ability to uh, get students into activities that are a little safer, that are outdoors, um, or even partnering up with another family as kind of the family that your students go and see their students. Um, That's something I've heard of families doing just to make sure those social skills are developing. When it comes to academic, those things are really related. Students learn uh, really well in collaborative settings, and that's kind of the type of workforce we want to prepare is people who can work together and communicate. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely going to be a loss this year to not have that time to help these students develop. And I'm just hopeful that in the future um, we can come back together and and help these students again. Absolutely, it's a concern. And on the optimistic side, there is a potential that students could develop other skills during this time period. They could become uh, better suited at certain technologies. There's times where students can work on like Google Documents together or um, build projects together online. So there is opportunities for collaboration and for social interaction through virtual learning through distance learning. But that, as you said earlier, that requires innovation, that requires flexibility and learning on the part of teachers and students. So I think there is potential for these skills to continue to develop in a virtual setting, but it takes a lot of learning on the part of the whole community for those things to start to take place. And we also have to remember what we've talked about before, which is that certain students have better access to technology than others. And so that's another thing we have to be aware of going into the fall. And if we, if your child is in virtual education in the fall, those are really important things to keep in mind. Some of the things we've talked about before, which is that that daily structure falls on the shoulder of the parents. So even if you do find a really great online curriculum that works for your student, Uh, It's going to be the role of you as a parent to build in recess and art and lunch. And all of those things promote cognitive development and really help the learning to solidify. And that's why they're built into a regular school day as well. So, yes, anything you can do that um, sparks curiosity in a student or uh, drives an interest of theirs or is outside or movement based, all of those things are great for kids. They promote resiliency as well, which is one thing that our students may come out of all of this with is a sense that they can overcome even the biggest challenges. And I also sat down with Rick Seltzer of Inside Higher Ed to discuss the tough choices that college and universities must make about this coming fall. Let's take a look. There's been a tremendous amount of discussion, a tremendous amount of uh, consideration. You could say a tremendous amount of hand wringing uh, uh, across the <laughs> sector on this. A uh, couple of recent developments that are really important to note. Uh, last week, Scripps College uh, in uh, California said that it would be having a fall semester completely online. That mm-hmm. made it one of the first of the non wealthiest private institutions in the country to make that call. Um, some other wealthy institutions and some public universities had made that call. Uh, you know, Harvard said we're going to be mostly remote. Uh, Cal State said the same thing um, in weeks and months past. Um, but Scripps is not in the same uh, financial class as a Harvard, uh, and it doesn't have the public support that a Cal State does. So it's a more difficult call for that class of institution. Um, now. Scripps isn't poor by higher ed standards. It still has about $375 million and it's an endowment. Um, But it isn't as simple for them as saying we can recover the way that it is for a place that has billions in in its endowment. Um, A couple of things that the Scripps leaders said went into that decision. It is in Los Angeles County where local infection metrics are clearly trending in the wrong direction if you want to be reopened. Um, And 
it's also a place that really tried to think through all of the different ramifications of, of what this decision means for their students, for the institution. Um, if you look across the country beyond just one institution's decision, what we're really seeing right now is a patchwork. Uh, it's a financially perilous call for many institutions, uh, and many of them are, are looking at a number of different complicating factors. Um, one political development last week that could matter uh, is the Trump administration is pushing for international students to lose residency status if they don't take some in-person classes. Uh, that's a big deal financially because yeah. international students generally pay full tuition. Um, this push by the Trump administration is going to be tied up in lawsuits. But if it were to go through, you're talking about billions of dollars across the sector. Um, I've seen estimates that international students pay about $20 billion in tuition and fees annually. Uh, and then if you look at the economic impact, it's up to $40 billion if you count some of the other spending they do while they're on or near campus. Um, so that's a complicating factor in the decision making, especially for a place that is heavily reliant on international enrollment. Um, and then even if we were to set that aside and say, uh, let's just look at the other factors, uh, the decision about the fall isn't so simple as just do we bring students back or not. Um, a lot of places are looking at hybrid class options. Even if the students are on or near campus, the idea is you'll take many or most of your classes remotely online, uh, mm -hmm. come in just for necessary classes, or if you have just a science course or something that you need to come in for, to class for. Um, they're looking at various levels of social distancing, spacing out seating in class, in some cases, you're seeing single dorm room occupancy being uh, promised or dangled. Uh, I actually saw a really interesting item yesterday that Rice University in Texas is building these giant outdoor classrooms. They're kind of these domed, roofed things that are open on the sides. Uh, the idea of being more air circulation, less risk of transmission. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of uh, discussion, a tremendous amount of things being tried right now. But the bottom line is there remains a financial incentive for campuses to get students into dorm rooms. Um, the percentage varies widely based on institution, but room and board fees remain a significant portion of college revenue. Um, yeah. And about 43% of budgets on room and board, out of state and private students spend about a quarter. Uh, now most colleges are tuition dependent, so they have some other forms of revenue, but you're still probably looking at, at at least double digit percentages in total revenue coming from room and board. Uh, it's a significant chunk, especially when you're facing cost pressures on the sides of, are we gonna have to be sterilizing more or worried about any of the other hundreds of costs that the coronavirus has caused? More online education means more costs. Yeah. Um, that, then there are some other things that they're thinking about. Uh, on-campus persistence, student support services. You know, there are students who do better on campus. There are students who need uh, to get, whether it's mental health counseling, tutoring, or just kind of that face-to-face -face interaction. And there are students who don't have anywhere else to go. Um, so one final argument that I've heard that I think is interesting is I've heard presidents make the argument you don't guarantee students are safe from the virus if they stay home. Um, I'm really interested in that argument from a risk perspective because a student studying at home who gets infected with the coronavirus is different from who is at risk and what institution and how the institution is exposed to risk from a student who is on campus and you have a widespread outbreak. Um, I don't pretend to know which one is right, but I think this is going to be a really interesting study for us all to look back on in risk management. Um, we're watching the understanding of what consumers, college students and families want. It's changing. Maybe yeah. what they want at the beginning of summer is different than what they want now. So there is just there's a, a lot of a lot of things to unpack in there. It's interesting. The uh, the decisions, the decision making draft dead points kind of seem to. Well, first of all, they were always all over the board. Um, but yeah. you're right. We're getting into we're getting into crunch time here. Um, a lot of places that signaled signs that they wanted to bring students back onto campus. Um, what they did is they moved up the date of classes starting or pushed it as early as possible in August, um, generally still what I've seen mid to late August, but but you have a condensed schedule. They're saying we're going to get all our classes in between August and Thanksgiving. And after Thanksgiving, we're not going to bring students back. Um, so <laughs> we really are pretty close to it now. We're mid July and the public health understanding is changing, right? The metrics are changing every day. Uh, and 
there's a large silence as far as when we're going to make the call nationally, right? It's kind of on an ad hoc basis. Some institutions may say this. Most institutions at this point that I have seen, uh, and this isn't a scientific study, but but most I've seen have signaled we intend to be open unless something changes. We intend to bring students back unless something changes. Uh, So uh, my guess is you'll see if you see a spike continue nationally, I think Mm -hmm. you'll probably see some changing announcements. Um, probably at the end of July would be another point to watch, but that is, that's just kind of my armchair read of it. I haven't heard anything that I would consider to be a strong signal yet. Generally speaking, there was a a large, um, sense of disappointment in how the spring move online went. Um, Mm -hmm. families and students largely didn't seem to like it. Now there's a lot going on there. I don't know that it's totally fair to, to say that that, that that was the the best learning that that colleges could put out. But it's a big concern. They're promising something better for the fall. Um, We will have to see how it actually happens. But um, this question of if they don't come, and there were questions of whether students were going to put down deposits and just enroll in cheaper options, right? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I go to community college for a year, study online for a year instead of showing up on campus. I mean, all that question about the value proposition is wrapped up in there. And it's, it's a real concern about um, value, retention, and, and learning. Yeah, there, there's, uh, there are no easy answers in any of this. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. But as you know, we're not done for the week because tomorrow we've got our Sunday show, BRN Sunday. It's a podcast where I'm joined by members of the media, academia, and financial services to analyze all the news in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, and more. You're not going to want to miss this show. So until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, Roll with the changes. Attention. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. I called the Medicare Coverage Helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-757-1451. That's 1-800-757-1451.